Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can't believe it's Wednesday and time for another uh, study hall here on Facebook Live with Napa Valley Wine Academy. Uh, today, as promised, we have Catherine uh, Bouguet with us, our Director of Education, and she will be taking you through a WSET Level 3 tasting note uh, for red wine. So this is going to be great uh, for anyone um, studying for the WSET Level 3 who's looking to understand the systematic approach to tasting better and exactly what the WSET is looking for in the perfect tasting note. Um, she will be covering uh, one uh, red wine, which she will be revealing, uh, and should give you really good um, uh, tools and, and, and tricks to to master that uh, tasting tasting portion. Uh, so without further ado, let me bring Catherine uh, on screen and uh, enjoy today's study hall. Thanks so much, Chris. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. Really excited to take you through a red wine using the systematic approach. Um, I'm going to reveal the wine today, and there's a reason for that. I'm going to be tasting a complex red, a Grand Reserva Rioja. And the reason why I want to reveal it um, is because the WCT is very interested when they test you on you knowing about uh, what's involved with a complex wine versus a simple wine. So in future webinars, we will be covering um, simple wines, a white and then a red, so that we can discuss what's different. How would I know? You know, how do, how do I determine that a wine is simple? Um, because that's going to be very important in the WCT Level 3. But anyway, without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into our Grand Reserva Rioja. The very first thing we want to do is look at the appearance of the wine. When it comes to appearance, there are only two points available for the wine, even though there's four things on your SAT card. We're going to hone in right where the points lie. You can create acronyms for yourself so that you remember what to cover in each of the sections. If we're talking about appearance, it's intensity of the color and then color itself where the two points lie. Um, so it could be ick, for instance, as your acronym. Anyway, let's talk about the intensity of the wine. And what we're looking for is the saturation of color or the intensity of the pigmentation. So generally we would angle the wine down at 45 degrees and look from the core, from the center of the wine to the rim to determine that saturation of that color. However, WSET London teaches something interesting. With a red wine, there's a different trick to use. Put your glass down, you know, either on your exam paper or on a white piece of paper, you know, if you're at home studying, and you're gonna look down into the wine. Um, is it impossible to see where the stem meets the bowl? I don't know, for any of you who have a glass of wine in front of you, if it's red, go ahead and look down in the glass. Can you see where the stem meets the bowl? Clearly, not just a glimmer. We want a clear look at the full circle. For my glass, I look down, and it's just a black abyss. Um, so, can't see anything, it's opaque, so it's a deep intensity. Now, if your wine is not deep, you need to decide between medium and pale. The way that WSAT taught me to, to teach is you take the glass then and you put it down on top of either your SAT card or your exam paper. Let the glass hover right above it. You're going to look through the core of the wine, not the rim. You're going to look through the core. Can you read every single word that's on either your SAT card or on your exam? If the answer is no, it's medium. If the answer is yes, then it's pale. So that's a nice cheat sheet way to look at your intensity of a red wine. Now let's go off to color. You've got different choices for a red wine. Purple. A lot of students that I have say, ah, oh, is it purple? Is it ruby? Or if it's obviously purple. Of course, call it purple. You might see a lot of bluish hue in the wine to call it purple. A lot of Argentinian Malbecs, um, Northern Rhone Syrahs can be purple, but also Zinfandel and some others may be purple. But a lot of wines are more going to be ruby. That's your youthful red is going to be called ruby here. When do you move it off to garnet? Only if you see some brown or orange in the wine. It's mostly ruby, but there's some brown or orange. And then you may ask, okay, but when do I move it off to tawny? Well, tawny is when you've got 
a lot of orange or brown, but you can still detect some ruby. And of course, brown is brown. So for my wine here, and I know it would be hard for you to see from home, but my wine here is mostly ruby, but I have some brown. So I'm going to be calling that garnet. It's a garnet wine. So let's move off to the nose. For the nose, there's seven points available. One for the intensity of the aromas, five for aroma characteristics, and one for aroma development. Now keep in mind that development does appear here under the nose. When you're writing your note on the exam, sometimes I think students forget, and then they tag it on in the palate section. There's no point for palate development. It must go up in the nose section on your exam sheet. So please keep that in mind. All right, so we have seven points in front of us. How are we gonna get all of those points? Um, I'm gonna teach you that now. So a very first one is our intensity. If you like, you can think of it, um, um, it a music analogy. How loud is your wine? How intense are those aromas? The way the WSET teaches, you take the glass, you put it under your nose, and you don't actively sniff. I know this confuses a lot of people, but you don't actually go ahead and go, and, and take in. So you just put the nose, uh, sorry, the glass under your nose. If by just doing that, you can start to describe the wine. Wow, red cherry, red raspberry, nutmeg, toast. Um, if you're already starting to describe that wine just under your nose, that means that you've got a pronounced intensity. Okay, now wonder if you don't. Now you're gonna go ahead and swirl, smell, if it's hard for you to pull out aromas, if it's very faint, that's when you're gonna call it light. So if you're not pronounced though, and you're not light, then, and only then are you in the medium camp. So it's almost like you wanna check off the ends, right? Is it pronounced or light? And if not, then you're in the medium camp. And only when you're in the medium camp would you consider whether you bump it up to medium plus or ding it down to medium minus. And so that's just going to be a call on intensity. So for my wine, because I put it under my nose and I got all these aromas right away, easily detectable, I have a pronounced wine. So let's go off to aromas. First of all, I want to make it clear, everybody, everybody can be great at detecting aromas. I get so many students who come in and they're, they're like, you know, I'm, I'm not good at this. And I'm like, oh my goodness, you can absolutely be good at this. All you need to do is build up your memory bank. You need to go and smell things, smell fruit, smell spices, smell flowers. Because once you put that in your memory bank, then when you're smelling a wine, you'll go, I know that. And you'll pull it out of your memory bank and have it right there um, um, to easily you know, detect from the wine. So all it takes is practice, practice smelling everything. Okay, so in the level three, we have to think of the three types of aromas. We've got primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary is gonna be anything from the, you know, from the fruit itself, from the grape itself, through alcoholic fermentation. Secondary is what you're gonna do after alcoholic fermentation. So whether you, you know, put the wine through malolactic fermentation, you know, whether there's lees stirring, whether you put the wine in oak. In a red wine, the oak impact is going to be the most detectable. Really because of everything else, tannins and everything else going on in a red wine, it's harder to decipher things from lees aging and most red wines go through malolactic fermentation anyway. Uh, and now tertiary, our last type, are aromas that develop with maturity, with age. Now we have a Grand Reserva Rioja has to age. So with that, we can pretty much say, okay, there's going to be tertiary in this wine. But to get familiar with what is a tertiary, the WSET makes it pretty easy for you. On the back of your SAT card, they divide things up into primary, secondary, and tertiary. Get comfortable with those terms. When it comes to the exam time, the exam, the grader, gets a copy that they just circle things. You have to write them but the exam grader goes ahead and circles them. And so they're gonna be using what's on the back of that SAT card. Now, of course, the WSET makes it a little simpler. They say, hey, it's okay, grader, go ahead. You can go look at the tasting note, 
you know, that the producer wrote on that wine and add in other terms. But just know you want to choose as much as you can those terms on the back of your SAT card. So when you go ahead with a Grand Reserve Rioja, uh, you know, it depends on, on how old it is. Can you still detect primary? When I go ahead and smell my wine, swirl and smell, I get great red cherry, red raspberry, blackberry. I get cur red currant, black currant. I get so many different fruits, but I also get a little violet. Um, I get a little herbal. I get eucalyptus. There's so much going on in this wine, and all of those things are primary. So for secondary, then you want to say, okay, hold on. Do I have any secondary? And while you're studying, go ahead and have your SAT in front of you. Even look like a geek at the bar. You know, who cares? You're studying. Um, and go ahead and say, hey, do I get, you know, vanilla, toast, nutmeg? Look at the choices there. My wine has all of that, all of that in there. Then you want to say, step back and think, okay, now I need to decide whether there's tertiary in this wine. So you go ahead and you think, step back and ask yourself, is this all about the fresh fruit or floral character or is there something else going on here? For my wine, there's a lot more going on here. So I've got tobacco, I've got leather, I've got earth, like dirt earth, um, not fresh earth, but you know, earth that's been around for a while. Um, so these beautiful components are coming in and those are all tertiary. When you have a wine that has all three types you need to have one of your five available points. You need to give at least one descriptor that's a primary, one that's a secondary, and one that's a tertiary. The other two can be whatever in whichever type you'd like. How, however, keep in mind, what I always teach my students is, don't just write five. Wonder if, you know, there's one of the aromas that the grader didn't find in the wine. Go ahead and write seven, eight, nine. Try to get those maximum five points because this is the easy place to get points. Now, don't go off writing 20, 30 different aromas. If they're not found in the glass, the grader's going to start to wonder. Um, your, your wine is tasted by your school um, the same day from the same bottle that you will be tasting it from. However, the grade, the, the papers do get sent off to the WSET. They will make sure and do sort of a double check. Um, so keep in mind that you want to be, um, you know, smart about it. But if you're even saying, hey, is there toast in here? Write it down. There's no negative points. Okay, let's go off to aroma development. With aroma development, um, you're looking for whether you notice, hey, is it just primary? Is it just primary and secondary? Um, or is there some maturity going on with this wine? So remember, youthful is whether you have primary and or secondary. I see so many students who write down primary, red fruit, red cherry. Well, you can't write red fruit. Remember, you can't write a cluster. You have to write a descriptor. So you have to write red cherry, red raspberry. Um, so a lot of people will go ahead and, and you know, detect primary, detect secondary. There's lots of toast and vanilla, you know, nutmeg. And they then call it developing. Ah, that's so wrong. You only want to move off to developing if there's some tertiary. That means that the wine is developing, it's maturing. So only use tertiary, uh, only use, sorry, developing if there's some tertiary. Now you'd move off, you know, on your list, you'd move off to fully developed only if it's pretty much all tertiary and you're not detecting primary and secondary. Uh, and then tired past its best. Usually we won't have a wine in the exam that's that old. So anyway, my wine has um, a lot of primary, a lot of secondary, but I detect some tertiary. So my wine is going to be developing. Okay, finally, let's get this wine on the palate. Let's talk about sweetness. For a red wine, you're pretty much going to be dry or off dry, right? Off dry is, wait, do I detect some residual sugar? Um, and dry is you don't have the perception, you know, of sweetness, of sugar on your tongue. 
Um, we had some great discussion with the white wine about how you tell between medium dry, medium sweet, sweet and luscious. So please go back, you know, and look at that white wine um, live um, Facebook live, you know, for that. But I want to move on today with our red wine. Go ahead and you taste it. You spit. Do you detect some residual sugar? A lot of people will feel it, you know, on the tip of their tongue. For me, there was none. This is a completely dry wine, so it's dry. Let's go off to acidity. We detect this the same way that we do with a white wine. It's how long you're salivating. While it may not be pretty to think about, your body, it's almost like you're just going to put on your acid hat and only think about salivating because it can be hard with a red wine. You've got a drying sensation that's trying to counter that with tannin. So you really just have to focus and say, I'm only going to concentrate on if I'm salivating or not. If you have trouble with this, go ahead and bend over some because then you'll pull that saliva. I know this isn't lovely to talk about, but you'll pull that, you know, to, to the front of your, of your mouth, uh, making it easier to detect. Just to give something a little more tangible, I do a count off with my students, you know, and if the acid keeps going past four, then I'm at high. Here's how I do it, I'll just do it quick here. So you go ahead and you need to take a big full mouthful of wine. No, this is no place to be dainty. Go ahead and take a big old um, um, amount of wine, swish it around in your mouth like mouthwash. You want to get it all along your gum line, across your palate. You want to get it everywhere. Again, I'm not trying to look dainty here. So now what you're trying to do is say, hey, of course, I'm talking. But right away, you would start a count off if you want to use that system where you would say, oh, I'm salivating. Mississippi. I'm still salivating, Mississippi. I'm still salivating. And you're just letting, you're just watching your mouth. You're feeling it pull the acid. If you, you know, get to past four, you're at high acidity. If you get to three, you're medium. If you get just past three, you're medium plus. Um, and then of course, if you're, you're one, you're low. If you're two, you're medium minus. But let me do that one more time, actually doing the count off. Okay, I'm salivating. I'm still salivating. I'm still salivating. I know that <laughs> this is probably terrible for you to watch me do this. But, but the point is, I want you to see, and you're still um, salivating. I'm, I'm still salivating. I'm past four, so that's my high acidity. Now let's talk about tannin, because we didn't in the last level three note, because we had a white wine in front of us. Not that white wine can't have tannin, but with red wine, we're often faced with tannin levels. And what I want for you to think about here, first of all, tannins bind to your saliva, causing that drying sensation. You want to, again, swish your wine around in your mouth like mouthwash. Uh, and now is, again, not the time to be dainty. You may feel the, the drying sensation along your gum lines. Most people easily feel it there. It feels like there's cotton balls stuck up and along your gum line. So it's like, how many do you have stuck up there? But you also want to see, hey, do I also have a drying sensation across my palate, my tongue, everywhere, uh, you know, along my palate? If you have it everywhere along your gum line, drying sensation, um, and all across your palate, you're going to have high tannin. If you only feel it along your gum line and you're not feeling it all across your palate, you want to go down a level, right? So you want to go from high to medium. And then once you're in the medium camp, you can decide where you want to go. So keep that in mind. Also, be careful with astringency. You know, often astringency you can feel towards the back of your mouth. You may have an unripe Cabernet Franc, say, you know, and you may have, um, um, you know, feel some astringency, but that doesn't equate to higher tannins. They're just astringent. So it's going to take some practice to realize that that wine is a medium tannin, but they're astringent versus higher tannins when you've got that drying sensation everywhere. So for my wine today, I've got the drying sensation all along my gum lines and all across my palate. I'm at high tannin. 
Okay, so let's go off to alcohol. Alcohol in a red wine, same thing as what you're looking for, whether you've got the warmth or even a burning sensation if it's very high. So for my wine, I do get, you know, I go ahead and my, I, you know, you can either take a little sip during the exam, you know, or even if you just, you know, spit, you can get a sensation, you know, of warmth. So when I do this with my wine, I do feel a little warmth, but I'm, my wine is just on the cusp. It's 14%, but it's showing it. So I felt that warmth. That's something for you to look for. Generally, remember that low is under 11. It's not a lot of wines out there that are going to be under 11. So if you're not feeling that warmth or any heat, your best guess is going to be medium. Okay, let's go off to the body of the wine. We're looking for the weight of the wine on our tongue, on our palate is one of the best ways to, to look for the weight. How heavy does it sit on your palate? This is against all red wines of the world, so you want to be careful. When I put this wine on my tongue, I'm not getting something as heavy as, say, you know, a heavily oaked Napa Valley Cab or a Barossa Shiraz. So for me, I wasn't in the full-bodied category. I definitely was not in the light category. It didn't feel light on my palate, so I was in medium camp. Now, only if you're in the medium camp do you then say, hey, do I bump it down to medium minus? You definitely don't want to do that with this wine. I even want to bump it up to medium plus because I feel there's some nice weight there. It just wasn't full body. So I'm going with medium plus for the body. Okay, mousse we only deal with for a sparkling wine, so we'll go off to flavor intensity. Often your flavor intensity is going to either match or be one level different from what your aroma uh, intensity was. I put this wine on my palate, and again, you can think of it musical. How loud is that wine on my palate? How much flavor is going on? There's so much going on, and it's intense, that I'm going to go ahead for my wine and call it pronounced. So I had pronounced for the aromas and also um, for the flavors on the palate. Speaking of flavors, that's next. Anybody remember how many points there are for flavors? It's not five again. It's three. Three points available. Again, you have to think in terms of types. If you have all three types, primary, secondary, and tertiary, the only way to get full maximum points is to give one descriptor that is primary, one that's secondary, and one that's tertiary. You can't give three primaries, even if they're all correct, you can't get full points. If, it, if the wine has a type in it, you have to give a descriptor for that. It could be anything. So I could pick my red cherry, I could pick vanilla, and I could pick my leather. And that's my three points. Are you going to put just three terms on your exam? I hope not. Put more. Remember, put five, put seven. For a wine like this, it would be easy, you know, to put eight to ten because there's so much going on in this wine. But this is a great, easy area for you to gain maximum points. So for the um, next on our list is our finish. For the finish, I like to do a count off as well. It's how long the pleasant flavors go. If you're, if you're getting like red cherry, raspberry fruit, and then it ends and you're just getting some astringency, don't count that astringency. Only count the pleasant flavors. So if I go ahead with my wine, and I say, oh, wow, red cherry, raspberry. Wow, same thing with Mississippi's in between. Wow, keeps going, red cherry, raspberry, toast, toast, going, you know, keep going. I'm using that same scale past four, and it keeps going. I've got a long finish. Now, the WST says, hey, a minute would be a long finish. Mine's definitely, I can feel it going to go into a minute. You're not necessarily going to have a watch on you. Using that count off um, is a great way to just all get to the same thing. So I do that with my classes just to give something tangible to go by. Okay, we're not done. We're almost there. Um, but now we have to deal with the conclusions. And for the conclusions, we have to talk about the quality level. When we talk about quality level, there's really four choices that you're going to use. Um, you're not going to get a faulty wine in the exam, and you're not going to get a poor wine. 
right? We test the wine. Like I said, we're going to taste the wine, the same wine that you are, um, out of the same bottle. So we'll know um, whether it's faulty or not. So you're going to go ahead and your choices are going to be acceptable, good, very good, or outstanding. Four choices. And it happens to be that the criteria you want to use to make that decision has four elements, right? So you're looking for balance, length, intensity, and complexity, what we call Blick. If you've got all four of the things in Blick, the wine will be outstanding. If you have three of those elements, your wine will be very good. Two, good, one, acceptable. It's an easy way to come to the quality conclusion. So take my wine for an instance. Um, let's talk about balance. Does it have balance? The WSET wants you to think about balance as the balance between any that fruit concentration and the other structural components, your tannin, your alcohol, your acidity. Did anything stick out or was everything in balance? With my wine, lots of beautiful fruit concentration and everything, the acid, the tannin, the alcohol, all felt beautifully balanced. So I give it the check for balance. Did I have a long length? And only if you have a long length do you give it a check. I did. Do you have intensity? Well, I had the ends of the scale, medium plus or pronounced. In fact, I had pronounced for both the aromas and on the palate right? The flavor intensity. So if you have either medium plus or pronounced in either the aromas or the palate, give it the check for intensity. So this wine gets that as well. Uh, now, does it get the complexity? For complexity, first of all, you can think about the types. We had all three. We had primary, we had secondary descriptors, and we had tertiary. On top of that, within each of those types, we had so many different clusters. We had red fruits, we had black fruits, we had, you know, herbal, eucalyptus. We had, there were so many different things. In our secondary, we had um, several things. In our tertiary, we had several things. So we have so much going on that that would definitely get the check for complexity. We have all four elements and therefore our wine is outstanding. Okay, last but not least, now we have to decide, okay, um, what is the level of readiness for drinking on this wine? Does it have a potential for aging or further aging? You have to ask yourself two questions. One, can it structurally age? Does it have something like tannins, acid that will allow it to age? If you say yes, you still have to ask yourself the second question. You want to say, hey, wait a minute, can this wine get more interesting? Will it take on more tertiary? Can it take on more tertiary so that, it, so that if you were to open it up three years later, we use three years as a marker. If you open this up after three years and you're like, oh, thank God I waited to taste this wine. It is even better. Then that is going to be a wine that has the potential for aging. It can structurally do so and it will get more interesting. And what we mean by this is say you have a basic, like a Pinot Grigio. It has lots of acid, so it can structurally age, but it's not going to get more interesting. You want to enjoy it while it's fresh and fruity. You're not going to call, you know, that wine a wine that has the potential to age because you have to have both elements, something structurally and it will get more interesting. So my wine, even though, because it's a you know, ground reserva, we know it has had aging, but it could take on even more aging. Imagine it taking on even more, to, you know, tobacco and dried fruit, dried, you know, red berries. Oh, it'll be so beautiful, even more complex. So then I know that, ah, oh, this could get even better with time. And it has the tannins and acid to do so. So for my wine, it's can drink now, but has the potential for aging. Now I want to know, are there any questions from all this out there? So the, the one question uh, we did have is, could you show the uh, bottle again and uh, mention the vintage of the wine? Great. So let's talk about what wine this was again. So the Grand Reserva, the Marquez, the Caceres, Rioja, so it is a 2011, a 2011 Grand Reserva Rioja. 
And when you think about that with a wine, a lot of times the producers won't make a Grand Reserva every year. Why not? If it's there, you know, top of the qual top quality, longest aged, people will spend the most money for that wine. Why wouldn't a producer make that every year? Well, you need that beautiful balance so that it's worth aging that wine for all that time in the cellar. So you want to have, you know, the fruit concentration matching that acid, that tan and that alcohol so that as it ages, it ages in a beautifully balanced way. So you have to have the right elements, environmental elements, climate, the good year so that you get that richness, that concentration in that fruit. A cool rainy year might not give you enough fruit to be able to, you know, uh, age as it should. Anyway, I could go on all day. I know you guys got other things to do. We'll just see if there's any more questions. No, that was that was it. A lot of love for you out there, uh, Catherine. A lot of people saying hello to you. So it's oh, always great. always great to see. Um, well, thanks so much for uh, this wonderful study hall, Catherine. And we'll be back on Saturday, 1 p.m. Um, Pacific daylight uh, time for another installment of, of the study hall. So stay tuned. We also um, have advertised or uh, posted a couple of more uh, Facebook lives that are that are coming up and we have some great ones uh, in the works, some great interviews. So uh, join us on Monday as well at 2 p.m. for a um, interview with Peter Marks and Tim Gazer on wine faults, specifically talking about TCA and some new discoveries on that. Thanks so much for joining us. Catherine, again, thanks so much for a great uh, tutored session. And we'll see you all back here on Saturday. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers.